Good evening, everyone, and welcome to our Wednesday night virtual Bible study. Each week, I get the pleasure of coming to you and sharing with you from the Word of God, and I look forward to our time together each and every week. Here's what I'd like for you to do. If this Bible study speaks to you or you would like to help us fulfill our mission of offering hope to our city and beyond, reach up there, hit that share button. <coughs> uh, this enables us to fulfill that mission of taking hope to our city and beyond. Again, welcome uh, to our Wednesday night virtual Bible study. And tonight I'm going to take just a few minutes and share with you uh, some thoughts from the book of Isaiah uh, concerning crisis. And it's just going to be brief, uh, not going to be long tonight, but I just wanted to come to you and share with you a little devotional. <coughs> uh, before we get started, though, I would like to take a moment and go to the Lord in prayer. If there's something in particular that you would like for us to partner with you in prayer about, uh, you can leave a comment here. You can send me a private message or shoot me a text message. And I'm going to set aside time to pray specifically for each and every one of those needs. One thing I do want to share with you tonight, or a couple of things, I want uh, to continue to be praying for Betty Goat's daughter. And then also uh, Carol asked us to be praying for her cousin. And I've got her name written down uh, from this morning. I just want to make sure I'm giving you the right name. Let me find it. I wrote, <coughs> oh, get to the right book and we will find it. I apologize for that. I want to be praying for her cousin, B. Uh, she's in Roanoke Memorial uh, with COVID right now. So I want to be praying specifically for those tonight. But also, again, <coughs> if you have a need, just let us know and we'll, we'll, Set aside time to pray specific for those. But let's go to the Lord in prayer. God, tonight we come to you uh, with grateful hearts, grateful for all that you have done for us, grateful for what you're doing in this moment, and grateful for what you're going to do for us in the future. God, I just pray tonight that over the next few moments, as we look at your word tonight, God, that it would strengthen us, that it would encourage us, that it would empower us. God, that it would draw us closer to you tonight. And God, we pray tonight for these needs. God, we pray for Betty Goad's daughter tonight, and we pray for Carol's cousin, B. Uh, God, just pray that your hand will be upon them. Give them the physical touch that both of those need. God, I just, we continue to pray for Brother Hoosier as well, God, that you would strengthen his body. And then, God, I just pray for every person who's watching tonight that you would move on their behalf. God, I pray that you would search our hearts, oh God, God, go to those places where we hide those secret needs. And God, I just pray that you would move on our behalf tonight. God, we love you and we thank you again tonight, Lord. We're, we come with grateful hearts tonight, Lord. Grateful for all that you're doing. In Jesus' name we pray. <coughs> Amen. Amen. Again, to, I just want to say thank you for taking the time to join us tonight. And uh, I'm going to take just a few moments. I lost my place in my notes. I'm going to take just a few moments and share with you uh, some uh, thoughts on crisis, how to handle crisis, or what to do in a crisis moment uh, from the book of Isaiah. But let's begin tonight um, with some, some, a brief introduction and kind of an overview of the book of Isaiah and a little information about who Isaiah was uh, to help you kind of understand the book of Isaiah. So the book of Isaiah has been called the mini Bible. Uh, the fact, this fact makes it one of the easier books in the Bible for us to understand. The Bible has 66 books in it, and Isaiah has 66 chapters. The Bible has two Testaments, the Old Testament and the New Testament. Isaiah is broken up into two separate sections. <coughs> the Old Testament has 39 books in it. The first section of the book of Isaiah has 39 chapters. 
The New Testament has 27 books in it, and the second section of the book of Isaiah has 27 chapters. The Old Testament is about the law. The first section of the book of Isaiah is about judgment. The New Testament is about the gospel. The second section of the book of Isaiah is all about the good news. The New Testament begins with the ministry of John the Baptist. The second section of the book of Isaiah begins with the prediction or the prophecy of John the Baptist. We see this in chapter 40, verses 3 through 5. The New Testament ends with the new heaven and a new earth in Revelation chapter 21, verses 1 through 3. And the book of Isaiah ends with this same prophecy in Isaiah chapter 66, verse 22. <coughs> Isaiah is regarded by most theologians and scholars as one of the six greatest books in the Bible. It is written in a picturesque poetic, penetrating style, it's full of similes and metaphors and parables and songs and visions, fill its pages. The New Testament writers quote Isaiah 66 times with numerous other references. When Jesus himself announced his true identity in his hometown in Luke chapter 4, verses 16 through 19, he read Isaiah from Isaiah chapter 61, verses 1 through 2. Let me see if I can find that. wasn't planning on sharing that, but this is, <coughs> this is what Jesus read to announce who he was. Isaiah chapter 61, verses 1 through 2. The New Living Translation says, The Spirit of the Sovereign Lord is upon me, for the Lord has anointed me to bring good news to the poor. He has sent me to comfort the brokenhearted and to proclaim that captives will be released and prisoners will be freed. He has sent me to tell those who mourn that the time of the Lord's favor has come and with it the day of God's anger against their enemies. To all who mourn in Israel, he will give a crown of beauty for ashes and joyous blessings instead of mourning, festive praise instead of despair. In the righteousness, they will be like great oaks that the Lord has planted. And I just completely read the wrong scripture. I read, I was thinking Revelation. It, it, it was actually just 61, 1 and 2. The spirit of the Lord is upon me. For the Lord has anointed me to bring good news to the poor. He has set me to comfort the brokenhearted and to proclaim the captives will be released and the prisoners will be freed. He has sent me to tell those who mourn that the day of the Lord's favor has come and with it the day of God's anger against their enemies. That's the passage. A scripture that Jesus read in Luke chapter 4 to announce who he really was. Matter of fact, Paul seems to be that Paul's favorite book was the book of Isaiah. He referred to it at least 80 times in his writings and a minimum of three different occasions in his recorded sermons. You see, Isaiah's writings have stood the test of time. So who was Isaiah? Isaiah, his name means salvation of the Lord or Jehovah is salvation. He is viewed by, again, by most theologians and scholars as the greatest of the writing prophets. His writings are comparable to Shakespeare or Milton or to Homer. He prophesied during the reign of five, of five kings of Judah, Uzziah, Jothan, Ahaz, Hezekiah, and Manasseh. Isaiah was married to a prophetess, and he had two sons, which he gave symbolic names. We see this in Isaiah chapter 7, verse 3, and Isaiah chapter 8, verses 1 through 3. His first son was Sheer Jeshub. It means a remnant shall return. 
and he was prophesying or speaking of the returning exiles from Babylon. His second son was Mahir Shalahash Baaz, <coughs> which means speed to the spoil, haste the prey. And he was speaking or prophesying of the defeat of Assyria. Not only did Isaiah write the book of Isaiah, he wrote two other books and they were not preserved, but he wrote about a book about Uzziah's life and then a book about the kings of Israel and Judah. We see this in 2 Chronicles chapter 26, verse 22. And then again in 2 Chronicles chapter 32, verse 32. Isaiah was fearless and courageous, even though public opinion was against him. He, he wore a loincloth or walked around in his underwear for three years of his ministry to dramatize the truth that trusting in ungodly nations would result in, the stripping, in stripping all that was good and lovely away. He preached for approximately 60 years, beginning in, starting in 758 BC. He was ministering around the time of Romulus and Remus in the founding of Rome in 753 BC. And during the founding of Sparta and the first Olympic Games, to kind of put it into perspective of when Isaiah was preaching, he was martyred. Isaiah was martyred by the wickedest king in Judah's history, Manasseh. It's spelled M-A-N-A-S-S-E-H. And tradition holds that Isaiah was sown, saw, saw, sown, sown, that's sown, yeah, sown. He cut with a saw, cut in half by a wooden saw. <laughs> Hebrews eleven thirty seven, And Isaiah is called by name 21 times in the New Testament. Isaiah began his ministry during the time Assyria was a menacing power in Asia, the 8th century BC. Israel and Judah were experiencing a time of prosperity and power itself. But sin, mainly in the form of idolatry, worshiping of other gods, was about to bring judgment. Now I want to shift gears and talk to you for just a few moments about crisis. In chapter 6 of the book of Isaiah, chapter 6 of the book of Isaiah records a moment of crisis in Isaiah's life. A crisis is defined as an experience or a happening or an event that changes one's life. And again, Isaiah experiences a crisis moment that brings change to his life <coughs> in Isaiah chapter 6, verses 1 through 8. It's a familiar passage of scripture. It says, it, it was in the year King Uzziah died that I saw the Lord. He was sitting on a lofty throne and the train of his robe filled the temple. Attending him were mighty seraphim, each had six wings. With two wings, they covered their faces, and with two wings, they covered their feet. And with two, they flew, and they were calling out to each other, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of heaven's armies. The whole earth is full of his glory. Their voices shook the temple to its foundations, and the entire building was filled with smoke. Then I said, it is all over. I am doomed, for I am a sinful man. I have filthy lips, and I live among a people with filthy lips. Yet I have seen the King, the Lord of heaven's armies. Then one of the seraphim flew to me with a burning coal he had taken from the altar with a pair of tongs. His, he touched my lips with it and said, see, this coal has touched your lips. Now your guilt is removed and your sins are forgiven. Then I heard the Lord asking, whom should I send as a messenger to his people? Who will go for us? I said, here am I, send me. <clears throat> King Uzziah was more than likely Isaiah's cousin. And he had rolled for 50 years. Two years. 
And he was a good king. But due to the fact that he didn't destroy the pagan shrines and the people still offered sacrifices and burned incense there, Uzziah was stricken with leprosy and eventually he died. You see this in 2 Kings chapter 15, verses 1 through 7. And now in this moment, the king has died, earth's throne was now vacant, and Isaiah's cousin was dead. It was a moment of crisis. I'm sure that Isaiah was uncertain about his own future in this moment, and not only was he uncertain about his future, he was uncertain about the kingdom's future. There was a crisis Crisis is a part of life. Every one of us who's watching this video has either experienced a crisis in our life <coughs> or we will experience a crisis to come. And when we experience crisis, when crisis comes, we generally respond in one of four ways. We can crumble. We can succumb to the crisis and the pressure of the moment and it can cause us to crumble and cause us to fall apart and to lose hope and lose sight of, of the fact that God is in control. That is one option. We can crumble. Another response that we can have is we can complicate things. And a lot of times in crisis, moments, in pressure-filled moments of crisis. This is what we do. We complicate things by adding to the crisis or we create, an, we create all new crisis out of that event. So we complicate things. That, that's a response that we can have. We can crumble, we can complicate, or we can cope. We can just kind of deal with the crisis and ride the crisis out. We can handle the crisis. We, we cope. We, we get by. Or we can change. We can allow that crisis moment to change us for the better. We can allow God to work through that crisis in us, forming us and fashioning us into what he wants us to be. <clears throat> and this is exactly what Isaiah does in this moment. He changes. The Bible says that Isaiah saw the Lord and he changed. How did he change? This is, this is what I want to leave you with tonight. How did he change tonight? How did he allow this crisis moment that he was in to change him? Number one, he saw himself. He saw who he was. In Isaiah 6 and 5, he said, I am a sinful man. In the moment of crisis, he saw who he really was. And he saw the fact that he couldn't handle the crisis on his own. And then he confessed. He, he saw himself. And then he confessed his need in 6 and 5. He said, I have filthy lips. And I live among a people with filthy lips. I, I need you. I... <coughs> I need you, God, because I am not even worthy to be in your presence. And when we get in the middle of a crisis, we need to recognize that we can't handle it on our own. And we need to recognize our need for help in the middle of that crisis. It's what Isaiah did when he said, I am a man of unclean lips. He recognized his need for help and he cried out to God. And in that moment when he cried out to God, the Bible says that an angel took a coal off of the altar and went down and touched his lips. And he said, this coal purifies you. It makes you clean. It's going to give you what you need. And then after he recognized himself that he needed help and he confessed his need or he recognized the fact that he couldn't do it on his own, he needed help. He acted as God directed. In Isaiah chapter 6 and 8, the Bible says, Whom shall I? The Bible says that God said, Whom shall I send as a messenger to these people? Who will go for us? God was looking for someone to go and take his message. And Isaiah responded and said, I will go. 
You see, when we're in the middle of the crisis, we, we see ourselves. We see ourselves that we are unable to do it ourselves. We cry out for help. We confess our need and ask for help. Then we need to respond and do what God says do. And when we do this, we will come out of the crisis better than when we go in. You see, here's the takeaway. <coughs> the net, here's the takeaway. I apologize. I'm coughing. My allergies are bothering me. Worked outside uh, yesterday, and so my allergies have the best of me tonight. The next time, here, here's, here's the takeaway, the lesson for tonight. The next time earth's throne is vacated in your life, the next time a crisis comes, remember that heaven's throne is always occupied. God is still in control, and the king has a plan. Father, I thank you tonight. I thank you for the fact that when we're in the middle of, of a crisis, we can be reminded that you are a sovereign God and that you are still sitting on your throne and that you have a plan, a plan to prosper us and a plan not to bring us harm. God, I pray that we would remember this in the middle of our crisis, that we would remember to see ourselves for who we are, that we can't make it without you, and that we would call out for help. And when you respond, God, that we would respond by doing what it is that you ask us to do. And when we do this, we will come out of a crisis better. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. God bless you. I love you. I'm praying for you. And I can't wait until the next time we're together.